Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to dress on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be um, available in our archives for you to watch later at your convenience. Both our live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so please do share uh, with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on Encompass Live. Uh, for those of you who might not be from Nebraska, the um, Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so similar to your state library. So we provide services and training and resources to all types of libraries in the state, so you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, uh, really anything and everything. Really our only criteria is that something to do with libraries. Uh, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, uh, demos of services and products, all sorts of things. Uh, we sometimes have Nebraska Library Commission staff come on the show and talk about um, services and programming and things we're doing through the um, Nebraska Library Commission, but we also bring in guest speakers and that's what we have today. Today with us is my uh, friend and colleague, Robin Hastings. Good morning, Robin. Good morning. Yeah, and she is just from just south of us, uh, Nichols, the Northeast Kansas Library System. And she is going to talk to us about creating a culture of privacy and security. Um, very important in libraries always, but I think even getting more important as more uh, bad actors or bad things going on out there and people trying to do bad things. You need to be safe about all that, um, both at home, but in your library for your, both your staff and your patrons. So I'm gonna hand this over to you, Robin, to tell us how we can do this in our libraries. Awesome, thank you, Krista. Um, yeah, I am uh, from, as she said, the Northeast Kansas Library System, which is due south of Omaha, about two hours. Um, and I have a copy of this slides uh, with all the information and the notes and everything at that bit.ly link. It is the original version that I did in um, computers and libraries earlier this year. Uh, I didn't make many changes and mostly in the notes. So um, the while the, the branding may be a little different, that bit.ly link or the Q, QR code there uh, will get you to a copy of these slides if you want them. I will also have this on the final slide. So if you um, are not yet sure whether or not you want the information and, and make that decision next, then. Uh, yeah, uh, you and, and if you don't catch, I just, I'll mention to people, if you don't catch the links here or the QR code, we will also link to it in the, um, on the show archives, when we put up the archive, the recording, we'll have a link out to this as well. Cool, cool. So lots of chances to get uh, get this information uh, later as well. So yeah. no further ado, we're going to talk about today um, creating a culture of privacy and security. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how to uh, achieve privacy <laughs> and security, but mostly the, the thrust of this is knowing how to um, create that culture um, in general, how to create policies that support your culture, and then figuring out what kind of culture you have and knowing how to improve it so that you are getting um, the entire staff involved in creating privacy and security for your patrons. Um, privacy matters. It is a, um, it's a very important uh, library value that we have confidentiality uh, for our patrons and so it is um, it is pretty important for everybody in the library and whether you are a director or a trustee or a staff member uh, middle management interested bystander whatever uh, whatever role you play in your library there is uh, a, a role for you in creating uh, a culture of privacy and security. And this proactive preventative paranoia, uh, my friend Maurice Coleman came up with that statement and I have stolen it um, shamelessly. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a good way to think about what 
how you want to do um, all your work as as a librarian because mm -hmm. as we go through this uh, session we'll talk about some of the things that that can happen <laughs> in libraries mm -hmm. so, and it seems you know the two two of them seem nice and good but paranoia you need to have a little bit of that yeah <laughs> just a little bit i mean uh, my my husband's favorite phrase is just because i believe someone's following me doesn't mean there isn't someone following me just because i'm paranoid mm -hmm. doesn't mean there's someone True. not someone right. following me. that's it yeah. so yeah <laughs> uh and i wanted to kind of go a little bit into uh the differences here i'm going to talk about things that you do uh, to ensure privacy and security for your uh, your libraries. And there's a difference between equality, the left side of the cartoon, and equity. You may have to do things, more things for certain populations than you do for others, and that's okay. I just wanted to be sure that um, I'm, you know, what you have to do for folks to, to ensure their privacy and security in your library is is okay just wanted to get that going so the reason we worry about uh, privacy and security in libraries is that uh, intellectual freedom comes from privacy without it you have a chilling effect if people feel that their requests will be made public what they're reading what reference questions are asking that kind of thing um, they will that will uh, uh, keep them from asking maybe things that they don't want out in public. Um, and so it will it will give a chilling effect to uh, their requests. So um, this is supposed to be icicles for that chilling effect. I don't, I don't know how that comes across on your screens, but uh, I'm not an artist. So anyway, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it also gives them, uh, if they know that when they come to the library and they check things out, it's confidential, that gives them confidence in their library. They can use it without thinking, basically, without double double um, consideration of what they're checking out, what they're asking, that kind of thing. Um, the Fourth Amendment is uh, a, a, it's a thing, and uh, if we don't use it, we'll lose it, right? So uh, the Fourth Amendment gives people the promise of security and privacy in their papers, and that includes, uh, and I'm, I think I will mention this uh, later, uh, all 50 states have some kind of confidentiality requirement for libraries. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we need to make sure that we're, we're upholding that or we'll end up losing it. Uh, like I mentioned in the last slide, the equity uh, option, if, if people are from marginalized uh, populations and they are using your library, some of them may need more privacy than others. They, they may require more confidentiality than others. And that equity where everybody has a, um, everybody's being thought of as deserving of privacy and confidentiality that meets their needs is real important. And finally, personal safety. Uh, a lot of times, especially in very small libraries, uh, people will call and say, hey, my daughter's supposed to be there. Can I, you know, talk to her? Can you, is she there, basically? And you can give out that information over the phone, but unless you know for a fact that's her mother, you might be giving that information to a predator or to um, someone who has bad intentions. So making that a policy, you just don't give out that information, uh, is part of providing safety for everyone in the library, including, um, like I said, children, vulnerable folks, uh, just making sure that that is, is not something that you're, um, you're giving out, basically. It helps with the personal safety. Yes, yeah. so, you're talking about the um, confidentiality rules and whatnot, and just for those people who are here from Nebraska, which I see there are a lot, um, mm -hmm. we do have a Nebraska state statute about um, giving out, um, revealing the identity of library patrons. Um, yeah, I think, I think 48 states have a statute of some sort like yeah. that. The, and libraries are specifically listed in statute, in Nebraska mm -hmm. statute 84-712.5, section 13, <laughs> in case you want to look it up, that um, specifically mentions public libraries <clears throat> not revealing the identity of a library patron unless publicly already in like open court or open meeting, you know. Mm -hmm. 
but mm -hmm. in general, you do not reveal um, by state statute anything that would um, give out any information or provide anything that will identify your patrons. Exactly. So um, that is, like I said, 48 states have some sort of statute on the in the books on that. The other two that don't have attorney general opinions that state that library data must be kept confidential. So all 50 states have something. Yeah. So your role in creating uh, policies and um, privacy and security uh, culture in your library uh, depends on your role in the library. So like you're, if you're a board member, um, you are going to work on writing policies that are comprehensive, show your commitment to the patron's privacy, and I will have slides, examples later um, about what kind of policies are, uh, are our best, <laughs> best practices kind of things. And administrators help the boards write the policy, obviously, and then make sure all staff know the policies. Uh, in management, you're going to basically disseminate the policy. You're going to make sure that every cent, everyone understands their part in that policy and get inputs and ideas from frontline staff. Sometimes you try something and it just doesn't work. Uh, frontline staff are going to be the folks who are going to tell you about that. And the court, of course, um, those frontline staff folks, uh, you guys understand and implement the policy. You report back to your management about where you find things are, are weak or non-existent and any issues that folks might be having. So any questions, feel free to interrupt. Uh, Yep. Yeah, type anytime you think of something in the question section and I will jump in and interrupt Robin with your questions. <laughs> so uh, how do you promote, ensure these privacy best practices? Well, culture. Um, it is a change of mindset in the library itself. Mm -hmm. So you're going to be modeling the actions you want to become um, as part of your culture. So if you expect people to use password managers and two-factor authentication and privacy protecting practices in general that you want your staff to embody, you need to be doing that as well. And whether that you are board, all, you know, staff, whatever your role is, um, it's important for everybody to be modeling proper behavior. Um, but even with the right policies in place, if you're not following those policies and the culture uh, is one of kind of, yeah, that's what we do, pay lip service, uh, that's gonna be a problem. So um, that, is, that is something that is important for everyone in the library to do. So the informal definition of what a culture is, um, it's up on the screen, short shared goals and values, how employees work together, those policies and procedures that are written down and followed, uh, and then how decisions are made in the organization. Um, that's kind of an informal definition. The formal definition here, uh, the number two definition in the Oxford Languages Dictionary that's used by Google, um, I've, I've got customs. Uh, bolded here, it's not bolded in the original, but I've got it bolded here because that is, um, that's kind of what the custom that your staff, the customs that your staff uh, follow really do um, help to make that, um, that culture. So mm -hmm. how do your staff interact with patrons? Do they always demonstrate with their actions the privacy commitments your library has made? How would a random visitor walking into your library know that you value their privacy and work to keep it safe and protected? Um, things like chatting over the surf desk about a book that a patron is checking out can be problematic. Uh, staff chatting about patrons and their issues at the surf desk in front of other patrons is definitely problematic. Those kind of things um, tend to be culture, uh, whether you have a culture of um, sharing information in public in, in at the public uh, surf desk, that kind of thing. Um, those are, are definitely culture issues that can be changed, it just requires requires a little bit of work. And leaders often think they know what they're doing, they are doing what they need to be doing to make this stuff happen. Staff doesn't always agree. Um, a lot of times when you see surveys, uh, the leadership's like, oh yeah, we're great, and the staff are like, eh, eh, eh. So, <laughs> hmm? Mm -hmm. No, I was just agreeing, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
so one of the things that you can do if you're a library leader is make sure to recognize folks who are doing the right thing um, if you see it in action uh, that will help you guys uh, just be one more thing that you all can do as leaders to encourage this uh, this culture that is being uh, built at your library recognition is important so like i said earlier everybody at the library has a role uh, the board's role is to guide the definition of culture uh, to set the mission and values that create a culture um, so your vision statement your mission statement those can be set with an eye to uh, um, setting that culture up at your library uh, provide guidance to the director for encouraging culture. Job descriptions should reflect work that aligns with the culture you want to create, um, that kind of thing. So the board can have uh, a role there. Uh, your director can have a role. Hopefully your director doesn't look like this. Um, in the clip art, uh, open clip art site that I got this from, it's called Tyrannical Taskmaster. So <laughs> hopefully. <laughs> I see that. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> um, so nice directors, not tyrannical ones, uh, can set employee goals as you're talking to your employees each year and doing those evaluations uh, that align with culture, create operational processes that reflect the culture you want to see, um, model those actions that you want to see in your culture. If you're requiring everybody to use a password manager and you don't, people notice those things. <laughs> uh, and then recognize the staff that enact your cultural norms. Again, recognition is a really important part of enforcing uh, cultural change. So management, if you're a, a department head or um, a, a supervisor of staff, your role is to ensure that the staff that you manage have um, the tools to make those cultural expectations happen. Uh, so if you require uh, everybody to use a password manager, you probably need to make sure that everybody is using that, the same password manager. You have a, a password manager that they can, um, they can use. And we at Nichols, um, we use LastPass because I can share passwords with folks on my team. Um, and that makes life a whole lot easier uh, when you are uh, working with stuff. So um, you can help with staff's habit formation. Sometimes this privacy and security stuff is just a matter of getting into the habit of mm -hmm. doing the things that you need to do. So you can set the context, you can help them repeating that this needs to be done, and you can reward them. Again, that that recognition is important. Um, those three elements can really be used to help make privacy and security a, a habit for your staff. Um, and then there's like a lot of things that we do. It takes setup in the beginning and it takes time, but once you've got it done, it's so, so it's much easier. And it's so easy and, and actually useful and helpful to you. And yeah. Exactly. It's just what you do. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then ensuring that policies uh, like removing access for staff that have left, um, making sure that those policies are carried out promptly, uh, those kind of things are, are what those of you who are in management can do. Um, as for the staff, like I said, providing input to management and the director about culture building uh, programs, whether they're working, how patrons are responding, um, helping to create those habits, uh, that you all are trying to build being you know a team player there and then you are also as staff generally the first line of defense for a lot of the um, phishing social engineering kinds of attacks so make sure you're vigilant as you do your work you're not clicking on random links and um, doing things that might compromise the security of your network which lets bad people in and and then they have access um i did <laughs> I had a, uh, she was actually the director of HR, but uh, a, a person at my former library who um, was not super uh, technologically um, aware. And I did quite a bit of, of training on, you know, looking out for those phishing and, and uh, things. And she came to my office one day and she was like, Robin, can you come look at this email? 
And I said, sure. So I got up and I looked at the email because I, I kept telling people, if you have a question, ask, don't just click. And she said, this doesn't look right to me. And I read it and it was an email telling her to download an IR, new IRS form um, to for her uh, HR work. Um, and the URL ended with .de, which mm -hmm. is Germany. And there is no way that the IRS <laughs> is storing um, no. forms on a German website. It's just not, not gonna happen. She couldn't identify what was wrong specifically with that, but it didn't feel right to her. And I think that's um, because we worked really hard at that library to um, just pound into people's brains that uh, if, it, if it doesn't feel right, if you, even if you can't identify exactly what's wrong, the staff need to be aware and thinking about what they're doing, not just randomly automatically clicking every link that comes by. So yeah, trust your gut. It's it's OK. And it's OK to ask. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, I get so much. Well, I didn't want to bother you. That's why I get paid. If you don't bother me, they stop paying me. So um, <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> so we've been talking a lot about uh, setting up culture and uh, what does the culture uh, that you want, how does that compare to the culture that you have? That's the gap that you're going to try and, and uh, bridge with this culture building uh, program. So hiring is an important part of culture. Sometimes mm -hmm. you want to hire for add, hire for an addition to your, um, your staff as opposed to just for fit. Uh, Sometimes that's that's a good way to start adjusting culture. And I, it's starting to become a theme, I think, at this point. But recognizing employees that do the work to forward the culture is a big thing. So, um, and I mentioned earlier that policies are a big part of culture. And some of the best practices for policies that can help sustain, create, or sustain a culture uh, get staff input, have technical experts look through it if possible, uh, do some risk management, and we're going to talk a, a little bit about that here in the next slide. Consider codifying update schedules. Put them in job descriptions or in policies, procedures. Um, have them written out so that you know things are getting updated, like um, your computers and your, your various pieces of software that you use. Uh, make sure it's it's being done on a regular basis and assign it to a role, not necessarily a person. People come and go, but um, generally you hire new people for a role and that role is, it, it just makes sure that somebody has a responsibility for it and it doesn't get lost as people, as turnover happens. Uh, include vendor relations and requirements in your policies and at the very end of this session today, we'll talk about that. Uh, and then set standards for privacy actions required by all of your staff, stuff like password uh, strength requirements and, and things like that that you um, expect. So those are kind of the things you wanna think about as you're looking at policies that are going to help construct your culture. I mentioned the risk, uh, thinking about risk. This, my friend Blake Carver uh, of Lyricis used this in a presentation and I have, again, shamelessly stolen it. Uh, it is kind of a way to consider which risks are the ones you really need to, to concentrate on. And of course, the risks you want to concentrate on are those 1A. They're risks that are likely to happen and they're catastrophic. Um, those are the kinds of things that you really, really want to um, be aware of that might happen and have a plan to fix when they do happen. Servers will die. Um, that's just, it, it happens. And sometimes when it happens, it can be catastrophic if you don't have backups. If you have backups and you do things, um, you know, create that, uh, uh, that sort of thing on a regular basis, then whether you get hacked or whether the hardware dies, whatever kills the server is not going to be the end of the world because you'll have those backups in place. And that kind of 
the idea of cyber resilience, uh, and again, it doesn't matter whether the hardware fails or someone gets into your server and um, deletes everything you've, you've had on there or whatever. Uh, the idea of cyber resilience it's figuring out the risks, figuring out how to keep the library running, even when things go wrong, and uh, having policies around backups and the concept of locks. Lots of copies keep stuff safe. Um, if you have a backup that you are also backing up, <laughs> uh, that is, is, you know, it's lots of copies, basically. So that's just kind of a concept that you want to consider. Take a second and get a drink. My jug of coffee. Um, my doctor asked me if I had uh, how much caffeine I drank, and I was just one cup of coffee. <laughs> um, so anyway, she was not amused. Uh, so <laughs> privacy policies. Policies are, in general, a written expression of a principle. And that is a direct quote from Martin Garner, the ALA Office of Information uh, Freedom. So these policies that you are creating um, are written expressions of the principle of privacy that is in your culture or that you want to be in your culture, one of the two. So first thing to do is make sure you have a policy. If you don't have a policy, uh, you need to create one. And if you have no idea, you need to look around and ask because um, that is something that is, um, it's just kind of, without a policy, you just don't have a real good uh, basis for making sure that your library is following best practices on policies, on privacy and, and uh, security policies. So there is a link to um, a sample policy that I think is, is useful in the slides if you are uh, interested in, in finding one. I, I You might have noticed already, I'm a big fan of, of borrowing <laughs> and uh, not reinventing the wheel. There's no reason yeah, to create really. your own here. So there is that. Um, and then we're going to talk a little bit here, just for a second before we go on to the next thing, about the privacy versus confidentiality. Um, Because libraries are a limited public forum, we cannot promise uh, privacy like the people get in their homes, right? So they're in public when they're in the, the library. We can do a lot to help um, mitigate some of the issues of privacy. Uh, I, you know, there's those um, First Amendment auditors that come out. A lot of folks have policies that do not allow um, those auditors to record computer screens or mm. the checkout desk. Um, they can walk around and record the stacks and the building, but they cannot record people without those people's express permission. Those kinds of policies mitigate the fact that you are in a public place and technically um, People can record in public places. That's just uh, that's just how it what how it goes. The thing with those kinds of limitations and those policies is they have to be um, neutral in in content. So you can't say these people can't record, but these people can because I like them and I don't like them. Um, it has to be neutral, and it can only uh, really talk about time, place, and manner. So you can set times that people cannot video. You can set places. Can't, they can't go in the staff area. They can't, like I said, record computers or, or check out desks. And the manner, um, they can't bother people while they're re recording. So the idea of um, privacy in libraries is, you know, we're a public place. That, however, does not mean we do not work really, really hard to make sure that confidentiality is protected. And that is, again, why we have those limits on privacy. So that's, just wanted to take a moment to, uh, to talk about uh, that kind of, um, that kind of thing. Videotaping and, and pictures and all that. Uh, I think laws vary by state, but in general, we are a limited public forum, and that means that when people walk through the doors, they cannot be guaranteed perfect privacy like mm -hmm. they have in their homes. So, 
Um, security policies, same thing as privacy policies. Uh, you should have one. If you don't, you should get one. And again, I have a, a, an example one in the slides. So you can certainly uh, take a look at that and see uh, if you can make use of that. And if you have no idea, you could check because it's a good idea to, <laughs> to know um, whether or not you have those policies and to familiarize with them, yourself with them. If you're a staff member and you have no real role in creating policy, that's okay. You should still be aware of the policies and you should know what your board and your administration have decided is important for your library and, uh, and, and just be able to, to do that. If you're creating a new policy, some of the best practices, you want to include how your library protects patron data. Uh, you want to include tech details. It, for security, you want to have, um, you want to be as detailed as possible and make sure that people are aware that you do virus scans once a week or with this particular program, that kind of thing. That means you're going to have to change it occasionally, but it's a good idea if the IT manager drops dead gets hit by bus, um, wins the lottery and moves to the Caribbean and throws away their phone. Um, you want to be able to continue working without uh, too much of a, a speed bump. Um, and that is, again, with the roles I mentioned earlier, instead of saying, you know, Jonathan is in charge of doing backups and, and Robin does uh, uh, virus scanning once a week, you indicate roles. The IT manager does backup. Um, the the assistant does uh, uh, virus scanning, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And um, something else you can include is who's authorized to use what systems in your library. Uh, too much access can can poke holes in your security, so it's a good idea to, to have that information there. Um, so you want to test your security policy regularly. Uh, look at it at least once a year to review it to make sure it's still valid and have in your policy how you manage a security breach. Um, what, who's informed, what your policies are, what your procedures are. Um, this is, can be part of your disaster planning too because quite frankly a lot of times um, security breaches can be disasters. <laughs> tell you a story. Uh, I was I was uh, the IT manager at a, a mid-sized public library in Missouri and um, actually I, this was before I became the manager. Uh, I was assistant at this point because the um, FBI showed up with a warrant and unplugged our file server and took it with them and my boss, the IT manager, he ran upstairs to figure out what you know how to how to handle the legal stuff, and I was left uh, to find a computer that would work as the ser server and put the backup from last night on it and get everybody running again. Um, mm. It's not uh, um, not uncommon for libraries to get hacked because mm. we are soft targets, and quite often we have a lot of space on our machines and big bandwidth. What the bad guys had done is they cracked into our server and they had dumped a bunch of um, software and, that didn't require codes and um, pirated movies. And so they were pointing people to our software, our hardware, to download their software and movies. And that was because we had the space, we had extra space on our file server and we had really good bandwidth. Um, and when the FBI uh, was Checking. I don't know if we ever got that server back, but it's uh, we did manage to to come back because we had policies and procedures in place. Because while we seem like it's it seems like libraries are kind of an odd choice for hackers, uh, we are not. Um, we are we are are usually better resourced and less secured. <laughs> Is that a good way to put it? Than uh, businesses. Uh, and something else, people are generally the primary vector for attacks. Most people don't actually hack into a computer. They hack into a person. Mm -hmm. So it's really tough, actually, to hack into a computer. There are software out there that can help folks do it, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but they're, for the most part, your 
um, administrative assistant, your frontline staff, they're, they're a lot softer targets. People call and do um, say, hey, I'm from IT, I need your password real quick to fix something, and, and people give it to them. And then now the bad guys are in your system and they didn't have to run a bunch of software to hack in. So um, there are ways to harden your people, um, just like you harden software. We use Ningio, uh, N-I-N-G-J, sorry, J-I-O. Uh, again, links yeah. are in the slides okay. here at Nichols, uh, and it's a monthly uh, episode, five minutes, four or five minutes cartoon, and it talks about a recent actual hack that has happened, how it happened and how they could have fixed it. And it's not mm -hmm. free, <laughs> but um, it was not terribly expensive to make it available to our entire region. So it was nice. Mm -hmm. SANS newsletters, uh, SANS stands for security and network system and network security, something like that, I forget exactly what. Uh, but SANS is a, a well-known, respected organization. They put out newsletters, one of which is actually aimed towards non-technical people. Nice. And so um, that's actually, I think, how Elizabeth, from my story a minute ago, uh, was able to identify that fishy email because um, I was making those SANS newsletters available to everybody on staff and encouraging them to read it. and enforcing them. <laughs> so I mentioned my friend Blake earlier, Blake Carver. He uh, talks about some security games that he likes to use. Uh, one of them is it's gone. He walks in and he takes away a piece of hardware or, or something that can be hacked or, or damaged and the staff has to figure out how to work around it. Like I had to find a new SERP a new computer and put the backup on it and, and do all that. He makes that into kind of a, I don't know, game doesn't sound like the right thing, but maybe a test uh, where it's kind of like doing a fire drill test. Sure. Now. See what exactly. we'll, we'll do if this actually happened rather than just talking about it in theory. Exactly. That's a great way to put it, Krista. It's a it's a fire drill. Um, I'm going to make note of that, by the way. Um, and then I will next time Feel I do it. Go ahead. <laughs> I stole from my friend Krista. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, and then the other game that he talks about is Evil Patron. And that's where your IT folks get to put on their black hats and mm -hmm. look around the network to see where your vulnerabilities are. Uh, I have a shark on this uh, on this slide because there is a program called Wireshark. It is freely available. Anybody can download it. And what it does is it sniffs the traffic that's going on around you in your network. If it's not encrypted, it will show you what people are doing. Um, and it's, <laughs> I was at a LibTech conference up in Minneapolis, uh, Minnesota, several years ago, and Andromeda Yelton was up at the top, uh, you know, the keynoting, uh, doing her speech. And she was doing her talk and she had on the, she didn't have a slides on the, um, projection screen beside her, she had a whole bunch of stuff. It was kind of flipping by kind of quick. So it took a few minutes for people to start going, oh, wait a minute, whoa. And everybody kind of was like, oh, there's, you know, you could hear in the, the uh, audience, people pointing out everything we were tweeting, emailing, um, web browsing, any anything we were doing other than sitting and listening to her was being shown up there. She had Wireshark going and there was no security on the network in the college I think we were at. Mm -hmm. And um, she was basically displaying every everything we were tweeting and everything we were emailing, stuff that we thought was private. She was picking it up and displaying it. You can sit in your library with a laptop and Wireshark on that laptop and see everything that's going on in your library uh, and, and any bad guy can too. So uh, there's ways to secure your, your network from people doing this, but even if you don't secure your network, strongly recommend that folks do secure their browsing uh, VPNs or, or however, but uh, that was a, a very um, 
eye-opening. Eye-opening. Yes, that's, that's what I was looking for. <laughs> that was an eye-opening moment. Uh, it, it was probably eight years ago, maybe more, and uh, I still viscerally remember looking up and going, whoa. <laughs> that's uh -huh. um, so your privacy audit, similar to your security audit, uh, is where you go around and you have kind of a checklist. So where is user data collected in your library? What information is collected? Do you need all of it? Uh, who has access to that data? Do volunteers who maybe aren't trained on privacy and security have access to it? How do you store your data? Um, is that storage secure? Do vendors have access to your data? Again, we'll be talking about vendors uh, in a little bit, but uh, uh, there are lots of things you can do. Um, there's a link on the slides to ALA's uh, privacy checklist. Mm -hmm. They have um, several levels of privacy that you can go through. Uh, I strongly encourage you to um, use the at least the, the base level of privacy and go as far as you can. Uh, in protecting folks' privacy in your library. Um, but those links are there and you can take them and create a team and go through each checklist and whatever priority level is right for you and identify what needs to be improved, improve it, and then repeat that process uh, so that you are, there's supposed to be, uh, there it is, it's slow, sorry. Rinse and repeat, basically. Just keep going through it until um, you have a private library. So that's uh, um, that's something that you can do as a privacy audit to make sure that things are done in your library. So I mentioned we would finish up the section here, um, the talk with talking about vendors and privacy. This is something that not a lot of libraries think about but we hand off a whole bunch of information to vendors. And sometimes we're not real good about making sure that they are as committed to our patrons' privacy as we are. So um, there's that, you know, the privacy, and then there's the security. Uh, honestly, I don't remember the name of the vendor who did this, but at that, that library in Missouri, uh, he came to give us a demo some library software. And he plugged, this was probably prior to having good wireless because he plugged into our network, like physically plugged a, a cable into our wall and then into his laptop. At which point every single one of my um, public computers uh, got the um, code red virus. He <laughs> handed it off to everybody. Um, yeah. <laughs> so uh, make sure that they are as privacy and security minded <laughs> as you are. I don't, I, I don't remember who the vendor was because we did not go with them. Um, <laughs> they lost that sale. So, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, what? what are you doing? I spent like the next week cleaning computers. It was insane. But some of the things that you can do um, to when you're thinking about vendors and you're looking through, if you are in a position to be signing those contracts, uh, you want to look for vague terms, lack of transparency in the contract, things that they're not defining that might have uh, multiple meanings, uh, lack of info about what happens to data at the end of the contract. Do they keep your data? Do they give it back? What, where is it stored? Uh, you do not want vendors claiming ownership of your data in any way, shape, or form. That's, that's a big red flag for me. Uh, and, and similarly, they, they reserve the right to sell that data. Huge red flag, it's monster red flag there. Uh, using terms like aggregated, anonymized, de-identified, without defining those pretty specifically as to how they do that. Mm -hmm. uh, using an URL for privacy policy, I have seen this happen where you sign a contract that has a, uh, a URL for privacy policy, instead of having the privacy policy printed out and included as part of the contract. And after the contract is signed, at some point the privacy policy changes and you've signed it. You're, you're, um, you're kind of committed at that point. So um, that's something that you, know, you want it included in full text in the contract. And then vendor monitors patron use of products. Sometimes you have to. I mean, if you're doing um, 
Google Analytics, Google is monitoring your patrons' use of your website. There's just no way to get around it. That's part of their, their that's what you're asking them to do, quite frankly. But there are other things. Um, if your ILS is not, and, and actually I don't know of any ILSs because mostly they're done by libraries and libraries are, are good about this. But if your ILS was monitoring your checkouts, um, these are things that you would want to know about and you would want to be sure were um, out of the contract, <laughs> not, a, not allowing them to do that. So to review, everybody in the library, no matter what your role, has a job when it comes to protecting pat patron data and privacy and ensuring the security of your patrons. Um, because patron privacy is a core value of our profession, it is something that we all should be working towards and it's a requirement by law in nearly every U.S. state, and because librarians create an atmosphere that is conducive to intellectual freedom, and you can't have intellectual freedom if you don't have confidentiality. So there is that. Uh, the, the what? Policies and strong security promote patron privacy. A lot of alliteration in that one. Uh, we can write good policies. We can create a culture of privacy and security in the library. Those are the ways that we can make this happen. And when, um, well, we're pretty much done here, we can uh, ask our questions and then you can go forth and do all of this stuff as soon as you want. The <laughs> earlier, the better. Now, now is the time to do now all Now is the time, that's right. <laughs> so uh, that is bringing us back to that proactive preventative paranoia uh, is a good thing. And it's something that you should all be uh, building into the culture in your libraries. Mm -hmm. So, absolutely. There you go. Awesome. More information, and like Krista said, there will be um, stuff sent out. So, did we have many questions? Right. Yeah. This the the link to the slides there. I've already got that here, so that um, it's all available. Yeah, I'll put up on my screen here. Um, all right. Yes. So thank you so much, Robin. This was a, a lot of a lot of the food for thought, as I'd say. I think um, some things some libraries have thought about. I, I'm sure we. I know we do have libraries that do um, uh, some of these things. Um, maybe not everything. Are not aware of everything. Uh, like I said, here in Nebraska, we do have the state statutes that. Um, uh, or how libraries are supposed to be run, and we did do an Encompass Life about Nebraska state laws um, last month. Last month, so uh, definitely want to you'd want to go look at that for more information about all of our state laws. Um, if anybody has any questions, yeah, type them into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. Anything you want to know about, any situation you've had at your library that you were concerned about, um, get your questions in. We have um, plenty of time. Yeah. We've got like five minutes left here of our session today, so you have plenty of time if you do have any questions or concerns or anything that you were wondering about. So uh, please do uh, type them in. Um, we did have a question about dealing with um, those First Amendment audits that mm -hmm. are happening in libraries. Um, it seems like it's a fine, a fine line, I guess, of. Mm -hmm they think they can come in and do anything they want and go anywhere they want we've seen videos of them going into staff areas and being told no you're not allowed in the staff area it's a staff area hence the sign on the door mm -hmm. um, but it can be very intimidating uh, where is the so the question is where is the line to we now need to call security or the police as opposed to we have these policies and you need to be you know the person is just standing there saying i'm just going to stand here anyways most libraries have patron behavior policies yeah, and exactly. almost all of the audits I've seen at least violate those. They bother people. Uh, and then when they are violating your policies, no matter what they're doing, it, it's not that they're recording because they're, they're ex exercising their first amendment rights, they're bothering people. And that is something mm -hmm. that you can um, kick them out and if they won't go, call the cops or yeah. security or whatever it is um that's the line that i tend to mm. put in there because the thing you mentioned yeah that 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 you have a, you have a behavior it's not you know they, they're trying to get a rise out of you in this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and just like some of these hacking things too, it's also sometimes, I mean, you said they were doing that at your library to um, use your servers to host things that were illegally being hosted. Right. But sometimes it's just for the fun, the mm -hmm. I was able to make this happen thing. Um, and they just want a reaction. They want people to see that, hey, I did this. And that's the same thing with those two. I think the, um, is we want to get a reaction out of these people and get them on film being, you know. Yeah, most of these um, First Amendment auditors, their YouTube uh, channels are monetized. So the more yeah. views they get, the more money they make, and the more you freak out and <laughs> give them that reaction, mm -hmm. um, yeah. the better they'll do. Right. So, Staying so just, calm. Yeah, and I think that goes back to what you're talking about. The everyone in the in the um at all levels in the library needs to know what all your policies are for everything, mm -hmm. and um know how to use them when someone does potentially break any of your policies. You'd be able to say right. and have like, here's a copy, here's a printed out copy for your reference, and here's yes. the thing you are doing that you're not supposed to. Um, mm -hmm. we're gonna have to ask you to leave today. You can come back leave. tomorrow. Yep. <laughs> you know and, whatever your your procedure is but yeah that's yeah that's... and um it's I, I like the idea too um someone's mentioning that they like that idea of the that uh of blake's idea of um practicing you know pretending mm -hmm. these things happen you know yeah do it's a um, role playing thing. Actually, thing yeah role playing someone just said yeah role playing <laughs> someone pretending to be one of these people so you don't get blindsided and, and like mm -hmm. those kind of situations with any of this kind of stuff when your security breaks down your computers go you're gonna panic if you mm -hmm. don't already have like mm -hmm. oh i know what to do we went through this i can do this <laughs> yeah. yeah we you know um as an it person i know how to repair to you know pull stuff off of backup and and put it onto a new thing. Um, it's something I've had to do in the past, but the IT manager could have done that too, but he was totally freaked out and he was upstairs in the director's office and it was nothing we had ever prepared for or had a policy for or, well, um, you know. FBI and, and coming in, yeah. I don't think many libraries have the FBI's gonna come to the door on their um... <laughs> Was It was stressful. Um, <laughs> so so yeah, the, the fire drill, the role playing, those are all ways, I mean, the more you do it, the more comfortable you will be when it happens. And mm -hmm. um, something that is, is at, you know, with the experience I have, it will happen. Mm -hmm. Don't know when, don't know where, but it's gonna happen. And yeah. I, I know of no libraries that have never uh, had any kind of issue, even if it's little, you know, the 13 year olds are, are getting past their uh, uh, computer security to get an extra hour of Minecraft. <laughs> Every library has some kind of of issue, and uh, knowing how to to respond to it is is important. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's that's just thing policy, policy, policy. That's mm -hmm. we can't emphasize that enough about everything in libraries. Mm -hmm. Don't wait until something happens to figure out what you need to do about it. Write up a policy. I talked real quickly about, you know, that should go in your disaster policy. I would be interested in knowing how many libraries have a disaster policy. Um, mm -hmm. It's, I, I actually wrote a book on using the cloud for uh, creating a disaster policy. And in mm -hmm. the research, I, I discovered uh, cars drive into libraries a lot, like way really? more than you would think. Um, huh. Okay. So that's a disaster, quite frankly. You've oh, you've got sure. a car inside the library. They've busted through your um, your window, and you know it, one of my libraries here in Northeast Kansas, strip mall guy hit the gas instead of the uh, brakes and went right through the window. It mm -hmm. tore up their technology. I mean, it it took the the wall down, and mm -hmm. so everything that they had in that wall, the electricity, the cabling, everything mm -hmm. had to be um, redone. It was. Wow. It's way more of a disaster than you think. And yeah. it happens more often than I thought. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and with all the different natural disasters happening, mm -hmm. I mean, you yeah. know, we've got the, the, the flooding up in Vermont and the wildfires everywhere. I mean, mm -hmm. here in Nebraska, we had flooding back in 2019. And sure. it was a huge um, undertaking for everybody um, figuring out what to do and if we did have policies and, and Mm -hmm. it's definitely something right now be... in Kansas we actually I think got to 130 uh, was our, our heat index in Lawrence on Monday oh. uh, if your air conditioning goes out when the heat oh. index is 130 degrees that's mm -hmm. a disaster 
You're losing ours, computers. Yeah. <laughs> ours is 120. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I keep checking it every day because we've got this excessive heat warning through through tomorrow still. Right. Me too. And yep, we hit that 100. It was. It's just you go outside. Like no, no. Yeah. So and and technology can be a disaster. Um, we had a, a library here in Lawrence, the library here in Lawrence, our public library, um, got hit with a ransomware. Uh, yes. And the backups had not been checked recently. They didn't have any backups, essentially. Um, they lucked out. They paid the uh, ransomware with Bitcoin, and Bitcoin in increased in value so much between when they bought it and when they paid it that they were able to, they made money, um, essentially. That is not generally what happens, and it is not best practice to pay the ransom dudes no, but you don't you don't want to you don't need to you need if yeah. you're prepared you're you're fine yeah. so. it, exactly if you've got backups you can say okay and you wipe everything clean and you put your backups on and you go on and and you're not funding bad guys but um but yeah it's it that was a disaster for them they were out of commission for a while mm -hmm. until they got their data back and it's a disaster just like a fire or a, or a hurricane or a tornado mm -hmm. or anything else that happens <laughs> all right so i don't see any there any other additional questions just in the last few minutes we've been chatting um uh, does anybody have any last minute desperate questions you want to ask of robin or anything you want to discuss get it into your question section um i'm gonna while well, i'm waiting to see if we do have anything i'm gonna st um start just my little show wrap up um so thank you so much robin for coming on today it was great to, great to have you here and good to see you uh, see your face <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you um, for inviting me. <laughs> yeah, and um, like as as you said in the beginning, this is a session that was done at the Computers and Libraries Conference, which mm -hmm. is held in um, DC, Washington DC, area every um, spring. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in anything like that, it's a highly recommended conference. I think um, it's a small conference, not a lot, not, not a huge group of people, and if you're a techie oriented or computer oriented it's definitely a thing to you um they do a companion i call it a companion conference internet librarian which is done in the fall which is now appears to have gone um fully virtual um they're no yeah. longer version which it's is unfortunate it was yeah. in monterey california monterey, california yeah, yeah they always said east coast you know. west coast which is really nice <laughs> for everybody if you go if you're on this half of the country you go to dc if you're in this half you go here and for us in the middle we can go anywhere <laughs> exactly exactly yeah, yeah. Yeah, but Internet Librarian in uh, October, I think, um, is on as a virtual one now. So look into that too if you are uh, looking for tech things. Um, so yeah, so um, here's the session page for today's show. So as I said, I've got the link here to the slides that were used today. So I will. Um, this will be included in our, our recording archive when I show you that. Um, here is our main page for Encompass Live. If you uh, type Encompass Live into whatever is your search engine of choice, we are the only thing called that on the internet uh, so far. I don't know if there's a lot of music. I, I like haven't, it. Yeah, I haven't copyrighted or trademarked it or whatever I would do, but it, hey, it's still, nobody wants to call anything else this, so I'm happy. <laughs> um, so these are upcoming shows, but here is our show archives. Um, if you look there, uh, most recent ones are at the top of the page. So today's will be up there uh, probably by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me. I will post it up there. Everyone who attended today's show and registered for today's show will get an email from me letting you know when it's available. And there will be a link, let's see last week's, yeah, there'll be two links, a link to the recording on our YouTube channel and a link to the um, Google Slides that are on Friday, just like this one from last, uh, two weeks ago. Um, while I'm here, I'll show you, um, there's a search feature here. If you want to see if we've done a show on any particular topic, um, you can search for it here. Um, we have our full show archives here. And I am not going to scroll all the way down because, as you can see, it's pretty huge. Uh, this actually goes back to when we first premiered Encompass Live, which was in January 2009. So we are in our 14th year of the show. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Uh, but um, we have a place to host these, so do pay, um, so we always have them available for you um, to watch for um, um, for historical purposes and whatnot. But do pay attention to the original broadcast date of anything. 
um, that some things will be fine and good and useful and stand the test of time, but some things will become old or outdated. Um, resources or services may have changed drastically. Uh, people might not work at the same library they worked at when they presented for us. So just pay attention to that date when you watch any of our old shows. But as I said, this is something libraries do. We keep things um, for archival historical purposes. And as long as we have a place to keep them, which right now is all in our YouTube um, channel, the Library Commission YouTube, cha YouTube channel, we will always um, do that and have that there for you. Um, we also have a Facebook page. You can see I've got a link here. I've got to open up over here. Um, if you like to use Facebook, give us a like. We post reminders. Here's a reminder to log into today's show. We'll meet our presenter. And then when the recordings are available, we'll announce on here as well. So if you do um, like to use YouTube, you can do that. We also still post things out to Twitter and Instagram. And NCOMP Live is our little abbreviated hashtag for the show. So we're out there on the socials too. All right. I don't see any other questions. I think we'll wrap it up. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rob, and for being here. It's good to see you. Thank you for inviting me. It's always yeah, fun. Awesome. Yeah, <laughs> I think we'll be back in a couple of months to talk about some other stuff, too. So we'll see you on the calendar again. Late in, I think. <laughs> Um, I hope you join us next week. Our topic, um, and yeah, I want to make it make sure everyone sees this. Um, next week, it's the last Wednesday of the month, which means it's Pretty Sweet Tech Day, which is when our um, technology innovation librarian, Amanda Sweet, always comes on the show and does something techie related. You might be interested in these, Robin. <laughs> but I want to note next week's show is at a different time. It's at a special time, 3 p.m. Central Time instead of 10 a.m. That is because we are bringing in guest speakers live from New Zealand. Um, and if it was 10 a.m. for us, it would be like 2 a.m. or something for them. So <laughs> um, the show is going to be at 3 p.m. from 3 to 4 p.m. Um, Central Time uh, next Wednesday. And it will be talking about Kai's education, which is about doing uh, coding and teaching coding to kids. So uh, uh, please do join us there um, for next week's show. Um, and if you know here, there will also be a drawing. Anyone who is at the live show will be entered into a drawing to win one of their um, uh, coding robots, a Kaibot, and things that go associated with that. So um, just for the people who log in live, we'll grab everyone's emails, throw them into a, a way of picking random email. I don't know if they've done this before. Uh, Renell and Bruce have done this in other sessions they've done. But so we are very excited to have them with us next week. So just be aware. That's why I've got all everything here in bright red, 3 p.m., 3 p.m. I won't be here in the morning. I'll be here in the afternoon. <laughs> All right, so that wraps it up for today's show. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again, Robin, and hope we'll see you all on a future episode of Encompass Live. Yay! Bye, <laughs> and stay cool if you're in an area anything like where we are. <laughs> <laughs> it's tough. Yeah. All right, bye-bye.